Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Bobby Haber, and I'm here in uh, Manhattan in New York City. I'm here with my partner, Joanne Abbott-Green, and uh, we want to welcome everybody from around the country and around the world. Uh, our, our second episode in the weekly series of uh, Mondo Conversations with our partner, Guild of Music Supervisors, um, and uh, my friend and colleague, John McHugh, will be moderating. I hope everybody's safe. I hope everybody's well. We have an amazing panel today. Um, some uh, just great speakers on the supervisor side, uh, on the composer side, and I think you're in for a real treat. Uh, so without further ado, let me tell you a little bit about John. Uh, John is an independent film TV producer, director, and music supervisor. He's held senior positions at New Line Cinema, Warner Brothers Films, Sony Records, and Universal Records. He's produced over 30 films, TV shows, uh, and has music supervised 75 films and TV series. John is the co-founder of the Guild of Music Supervisors. He's also an adjunct professor at American University. Uh, and uh, John has been a partner now going into our third year um, for the New York City Guild of Music Supervisors education event, uh, which will be occurring, we hope, in New York City this October the 15th. Uh, so uh, John, take it away. Welcome everybody and enjoy this great panel. Thank you so much, Bobby. And on behalf of the Guild of Music Supervisors, uh, welcome everybody. And, you know, we did this, we set it up uh, last week. We did one with songwriters staying creative uh, and how they can work on the aspect of writing for their own shows, even if they're not necessarily going in it, just being, keeping the creative process flowing, which is super important. Uh, so this week, we're obviously, the collaboration between music supervisors and composers is incredibly important. They become the music department uh, on, a, on do the heavy lifting on, on the creation, clearance, and um, you know making music work. So we have really great panelists today, two of our top music supervisors. Um, so I'm just going to go around the Zoom room, as they say, and introduce everybody, and everybody can wave when their name is called, much like back in school in the day. So the um, composing team of uh, Danny Benessi and, and, and Sandra Dryans done some really cool stuff. Um, they're two award-winning Boom composers, they've played music together for 20 years. They've completed well over a hundred uh, movies and TV scores, including a very cool film like Marth, uh, Martha Marcy, May Marlin. Try that one five times fast. Um, a Boy Erased, Amanda Knox, super cool. One of my favorites, The Wolf Pack. And they have some upcoming films called Devil, uh, Devil All the Time and The Rental. TV, uh, Danny and Sondra have scored Ozark, which is where I picked them up. Um, Chef's Table, Fear of the Walking Dead, American Gods, which was amazing also. Um, and um, they just do amazing stuff. Um, so with them comes along, uh, one of our, again, of our top music supervisors, Gabe Hilfer, uh, an award-winning music supervisor in both film and TV. His credits include the box office hits like Venom, Suicide Squad, and a small film you may not have heard of called Crazy Rich Asians. Um, as well as the uh, classics Black Swan and If Beale Street Could Talk. Um, his extensive work on TV includes Blackish, Ozark, Outsider, <laughs> and The Righteous Gemstones. And Ozark being one of my favorite shows, I, I was glad these guys would jump on with us. Uh, Evan Clean, seven He's time award winning music, Gilda Music Supervisor uh, at Neophonic, um, one of the greatest music supervisor companies of all time. Right, Ev? Uh, Emmy winner, and I get so. composer, as I said, and he's done the music, consulted, supervised on over a hundred films and thousands of hours of television. That's a lot of hours of television, pal. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Marcelo Zorvos, um, done a number of amazing films and TV shows. Fences, directed by an uh, unknown guy named Denzel Washington. The, Glo uh, the Golden Globe winning The Affair, and one of my all-time favorites, Ray Donovan twice nominated for primetime Emmys on You Don't Know Jack and Taking Chance. Uh, he scored the acclaimed film Wonder, which is a beautiful film if you've never seen it, starring Julia Roberts and another amazing film that came out over the holidays that didn't get as much recognition as I thought it should called Dark Waters, um, starring Mark Ruffalo and directed by Todd Haynes. So those are our esteemed panelists. Clap for them. Hey. And now uh, Joel C. High has popped into the room, and he is the president of this little organization called the Guild of Music Supervisors. And I'd like him to say a couple words about the Guild and what we've been doing <coughs> and what we will continue to be doing. 
Hey, what's going on, guys? Good to see you. So, uh, what's up, Fabian? What's going on, Gabe? So, thanks for doing this, you guys. Uh, this is something that is a brainchild of uh, uh, Jonathan McHugh and Robert over at Mondo, and they kind of teamed up and thought, you know, let's keep doing some of these great conversations using the new platforms. And it's turned out to be amazing. I think we had over 800 people uh, last week come in and uh, we keep building on it as a great kind of avenue to, to keep dialogue going about the excellence of, uh, of uh, putting uh, music to storytelling. So I really appreciate everybody for showing up and participating and wanted to let you know that we at the Guild of Music Supervisors are going to be uh, expanding on this and continuing some of this content. Um, we are doing a lot more things. We had a, a town hall on Friday to go over uh, um, unemployment insurance and small business loans and really crucial things right about now. And we're going to be continuing to have some of these things on a smaller basis for our members. Um, so we encourage you guys out there to sign up as members for the Guild of Music Supervisors. You can find us on our website, guildofmusicsupervisors.com and sign up. But again, we're going to continue these things because I think that there is a real need for it. And uh, last week, it was really heartening that uh, all the people who were participating and really enjoying it and watching the chat was fantastic and seeing people saying hi to each other that they hadn't seen in a long time. So uh, that's about it. I want to thank you guys again and uh, let you guys go. So John, you're in charge. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it's, uh, it is great to put every pe people together. And that's what as a guild, uh, we love doing. And the fact that, you know, composers, um, work in their spaces, supervisors work in their places, but they come together to make the, to help make the music components work for the film, TV, video games, um, compo you know, advertisements, whatever it is. So I'm just going to start kicking it off and, you know, you guys can jump in at, at, at will on the questions and then I will also uh, target some. So the first question is, uh, spotting. Spotting is the concept of you actually sit with the director, producer, um, and you look at the film and decide what spots get what music. Should score be there? Should sound effects be there? Should a song be there? Should a mix between a, a score and a song, which is called scores, or you can call it that, uh, be there? So talk about do composers and music supervisors spot shows together, or do they have separate spotting sessions for each the source and the score? Evan, you want to start? Sure. So uh, it varies and it, it depends sometimes on location. It also depends on where a music supervisor is brought into the process um, and also how much support the director and or showrunner might need. But generally speaking, at least projects that I supervise, uh, we're in the same room together. The composer, the music supervisor, the showrunner, the music editor, we're all thinking out loud, we're all working together, um, going down the road of figuring out where music's going and, and who's taking that spot, i.e. source or, or score. Uh, there, there are times when there is, you come into a project later and there's already a relationship well established between a showrunner and a direct, uh, showrunner, director and, or compo and a composer. And in those instances may or may not uh, have a supervisor involved in the spotting. We may just get notes saying, we need four songs in these four spots. Uh, can you um, figure that out? We'll get with the composer and work on the score. And that depends on when one gets involved and the needs of the particular project. And who's normally hired first? Is it composer, is it supervisor, or is everything just depend? That's really a relationship thing. When, when I'm wearing the HBO hat, that depends on if um, the script is asking for lots of songs or needs to be broken down and budgeted and we, have a suit, we, want, we need a supervisor support. Sometimes a showrunner or director comes onto a project and already knows who they want as a composer or a music supervisor. And so it really is on a case by case basis. We here at Neophonic hope to be involved and be hired at script way, way before pre-production even starts. That would be our goal, but it just it depends on the needs of the show. Got it. And Marcelo, because you guys have worked together, talk about the relationship 
composer wise working with supervisors and and obviously how it, how it can benefit your your craft i mean it's always very beneficial because um i mean supervisors can be especially when somebody has experienced and just creative as, as Evie, and they can really work as kind of like a facilitator and a translator with the showrunner or the director. Uh, all the projects I've worked with Evian have been films. And uh, there's been cases uh, where we are in the same room spotting together, like when we did Ali recently with Antoine Foucault, we were in the room with Antoine and the editor and the music editor all together hashing it out, figuring it out, even before there was locked picture and kind of, it was a very, uh, kind of very involved, a two way street. Some things were not, you know, this might be song, might be score, what do you think? We would try a song, we'll try score and kind of, it lasted for a while and there were multiple uh, creative sessions. And then on something like You Don't Know Jack with uh, Barry Levinson, I had worked with Barry before, we were both in New York and in that case, we kind of just did our thing and Evian was uh, always in the loop and kind of we were we were talking about what was going to be needed. And but he was kind of more doing the songs than I was doing before. And it can be anything in between those two things in these five projects that we've done together. There there being different levels of involvement, but always at some point our our processes will kind of merge together. Because as, as you guys said, you know, this is all about providing a great music for the film and wherever it's coming from, we are, we are the music department. And so. And let me ask you a question while we're on with you. Um, the, for example, the theme song from The Affair, Fiona Apple, um, is that something, because it's not like a score background, but was that something she delivered totally or was that something you gave, you had a theme and they put lyrics to? And how often does that happen where you collaborate with artists um, in doing that kind of thing? Or supervisors? Maybe? I wish it happened all the time. No, but it, it, it not not as often. I mean, uh, uh, with Fiona Apple, I had nothing to do with the song. She um, she's uh, uh, Sarah Trim is a huge fan of hers, as as am I, and like half the world. And and she was asked to to provide a song, and she had the song that was amazing. And the song actually existed already, but the lyrics were so they they worked so well with with i mean it was not a, it had never been published but it was something that she had written and it was it's a short song so it's not something that was condensed it was just this little jam that she had and then in the finale of the show she was brought back again to do a cover uh, of a song that was that ran through the entire episode and i got to meet her after the fact um kind of a sort of like fanboy kind of meeting but no i i didn't really have anything to do with with the choice of of that although i i certainly when i heard it the first time i was like okay this is it this is the sound of the show that's great all right so jump into ozark um gabe um supervising that and um composing danny and saunder um talk about the process on the making the music for that show um and just kind of get into that a little bit because it's more of netflix top show one of my all-time favorites um so if you guys can start talking about that that'd be great you guys, you guys want to start? I just want to jump in and say something about the last question real quick, I think, or the last uh, topic that, that having this in the spot sessions, one thing that we find is one of the biggest um, parts of our job, you know, besides actually making music, but is, is creating a, a dialogue and a language to, to speak with a director or a showrunner. And during a spotting session or any other conversation, creative music conversation, to have somebody who's not necessarily a composer, but somebody like a music supervisor, obviously, who, who, who has a sense of the show and has been maybe in it even longer. To have somebody there to kind of translate and, and help create that dialogue is super important. And we've always found that really helpful, you know, and it, obviously the supervisor and composers cross over kind of in, in different ways for every project. But when that happens in the right way, I think it's a, it's a huge asset to us. I agree. So you guys are all in LA now. So do you guys get the spot together on that show? We do. How do you? <laughs> Gabe, tell us more. We do. We spot together on that show. I mean, like, like Sandra was saying, Ozark's a really fun one because I think, I'm, I think it would be safe to say we all really have like a lot of trust and love in the room between Jason Bateman and Chris Mundy, who is the showrunner of the show. And 
you know, we're able to have very honest conversations about where we need score, where we need source, what it really needs to do for the scene and how it can best further the plot without giving anything away. And it's always a give and take conversation about like what's too much, what's too little, how to pull back. But like you were saying, once we have that language and that whole vocabulary with the showrunners, it's much easier to say, just pull it back a little bit instead of being specific to like, what instrument are you talking about? Uh -huh. and what, you know, like what specifically do you mean when you say that? It's almost like, I mean, the last couple of spotting sessions we were in with these guys, I feel like that was exactly what Chris Mundy said. He said, I, this is great. I just wish we could dial it down. 10 and, every, and everybody knew exactly what that meant. And having that sort of familiarity with each other and that trust and the understanding of what we all do is, is invaluable. And do you, when you're, when you're in it, is it like when there are borderline calls where, okay, this could be a song or this could be a source, do you guys step up and go as composers, look, I think I have this beat, let me try this. And in the meantime, Gabe, you'll back it up by trying to find something that might have a vibe that the Bateman or Monday are looking for? Yeah. I mean, sometimes it just, the decision gets made in the room. And then a lot of times we'll say, why don't we try to run parallel paths and, and like, we'll try a song and we'll try some score. And if it's, you know, and, and see which one works best and just have a bake off to see which one creatively feels the best. Yeah. But then sometimes it's an, it's a, you know, it's a time thing. I mean, just logistically, like it'll be a huge piece and it'll have to be a minute and a half long. And we're, you know, we got to deliver in four days and it just, you know, it's, we got to decide in the room. Like if, if the, you know, if composers want to do it, they're going to commit to it. But if not, if it's just going to be a 50, 50 toss up, it maybe their efforts are better spent on something that we know will stay in the show. Right. Danny, you have any thoughts? No, that's covered it all. I think very well. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, have a question. I have a question for Gabe. So I actually happen to find I'm not caught up on the new season. And I don't want to spoil too much for anybody that hasn't seen it, but there's a, a very popular classic rock band that gets a nice cameo in the show uh, this season, and they're asked to participate in um, in some nefarious activity. So talk about when you get a band uh, involved with a show like that, with a prominent featured music role, where they have a piece of music at the beginning, they have a performance, and then there's subtext that they're going to be involved, you know, in another way. How that works about being able to do that with an artist and, and, and did you have to look for other bands first before someone said yes, or was that always the first pick? No, that was the first pick. So, I mean, I don't, I don't think we're giving anything away by just saying it's the REO Speedwagon. And uh, early on in the writing stage, the, the writers called and said, we really, we have this cool idea. We want to feature REO Speedwagon. We want them to perform on camera. Can we do that? And uh, kind of up, it was up to me to find out how we get that done and like windows of dates that they were available and when we could shift the shooting to and, and uh, you know, and talk about money and what songs they perform and if they're familiar with the show and then all that kind of, kind of jazz. And then they wanted to be involved and have like, you know, where are they going to be woven into the plot? So it was a lot of pre-planning and getting them involved. And my favorite anecdote about that is when I called, uh, when I spoke to their manager, they said, and he was, they're super game, completely friendly, amazing to work with, everything like that. They said, hey, I, I don't know if you know this, but REO's bread and butter are playing casinos in the Ozarks. And I said, that's very, that's very convenient for the show then. So, By the way, something game amazing just happened. I asked that question because it's been in my mind. And then it's at the same moment, or right before, Jordan Greinke asked the same question. And so I lo I'm looking at it going, wait, how did that just happen? So nice work, Jordan Greinke. Great minds think alike. Uh, right, cool. So yeah, that's a fantastic piece of how, you know, life can, music can pull in and, and artists can be part of something. And I thought it was just a really interesting piece because the dentists do love REO Speedway. Yeah. Uh, uh, here's John, John, I was going to add a note about the collaboration part between supervisors and composers and um, if I if I might you might okay so an, another variable besides you know composers being in the composer lane and and uh, supervisors being in the song lane 
and you know put, getting getting artists to produce is is the hybrid of that and if someone like Marcelo and I'm going back to Ali who is super multi talented we were in the midst of Ali he was writing I don't know 90 minutes of score or some crazy number we were working out how to get that orchestrated and how we were going to do remote sessions and all of that stuff I, we were working on and finding about 35 different songs and but there was still a whole a bunch of areas that we felt were kind of hybrid that were scores and marcelo came in and literally wrote six or seven period tunes for the show and we went in and produced them together and uh to kind of I don't know, paste certain aspects of the show together with the source and the score and, and making bridges. And it was amazingly successful. And obviously there needs to be, there needs to be a relationship there, but there also needs to be the, the skill set for someone, not just to compose, but to also write tunes. Well, that leads me, yeah, that leads me to a really good uh, point. The, the, uh, the term temp love. Temp love is, as music supervisors know, is, is a disease that we work on. <laughs> with directors and producers and um, people who just fall, the concept is, you know, the director and producers fall in love with the temporary music that you've placed in the film or TV show as a supervisor or the editor sometimes will temp music in before we even get in the room. Uh, and it's very hard to get it out of their minds. So to have a versatile composer who can basically come up with things that get that temp love out of people out of the director producers heads is really a blessing so the more versatile the composer i guess the more ability to do those kind of things as composers talk about when you get those situations where you do have uh, a song that you either can't afford or you don't really need that song but you just need that musical feeling talk about what you guys have to do to create something new but give the director producer something that feels the same way and gets them out of that temp mode love? Um, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, I think the, the, the temp love thing, I mean, there's two different things. If you're talking about recreating a song or a style like what, you know, Evan was saying when he mentioned to me, let's write some 60s, 70s, like jazz kind of funk stuff. It was like, okay, I'll bring LA's finest to a studio, spend a day there. It was like, sign me up. I mean, it was just a blast because you can actually bring the, some of the people that might even have been playing in the original tracks. You know, that's how deep the bench in LA goes. But one funny thing, and I wonder with Sondra and Danny if they ever have a similar situation, the temp love that is the hardest for me personally is when it's my own music mm -hmm. from another show that is in there. Right. I find that pretty tricky. When it's somebody else's music, you know, you do your thing and you end up kind of hopefully kind of beating it or somehow making something. I don't think necessarily sticking close to what's there is, is, is the best way because, it, you know, it depends on what it is. You might just never get that vibe. But I find it very, very difficult when it's my own music from another movie or show and I have to replace that. I find that a lot, a lot harder. And I wonder, Danny and Sondra, I'm huge fan of you guys' work and I just wonder if, if what do you what do you guys how do you guys see that that temp situation we hate it all whether it's ours or other people yeah. <laughs> I don't know Danny you want to answer that yeah I don't know it's like one of those answers which starts with like it's different every time um, but it's like um, I don't mind copying our own stuff so because then you have that kind of feeling of like I'm plagiarizing, I'm copying, it's kind of out of your mind, so that's okay. Um, but, but yeah, copying a temp track and having a director being like, it's just not the same, or it's just not hitting me the same, and you've, you've slaved away at getting a piece of music perfect, like all the chords changing at the same time, the same basic rhythm, and then have them feel, tell you that it doesn't really feel right is a huge bummer. And, and it's like, <laughs> That's why it's sometimes it's really good to get into the same room because after it, beyond the music, you have to be able to explain emotionally why your cue works. Or if you, do you know what I mean? You have to be able to explain it 
using adjectives and, and colors and whatever. Like, no, you got to understand this piece of music works. It's, it's, it's better, in fact. You have to like let go of the temp and you have to try to convince them it's, it's hard. Um, and and seriously, I, it hadn't raised its head in a, in, a, in a few months or maybe even a couple of years for us. And now we just had one recently, uh, a, 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 some difficult situations where we're just writing the same piece over and over and try to change the temp or, or just like the temp, but like just trying to make it a little different and, and still wasn't working. Uh, and finally we said, can we just try to do our own thing? Like, cause we've been trying to copy the temp since the beginning and, and then finally it worked out and, but it took, I mean, the director had to release himself from, from the temp and it was really a long time. The whole team had to get on board to try to convince, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. It was very, very difficult. It gets very difficult and very frustrating cause you know that the piece you've written is really good. You know, to, Dan, to, to your point, there are times when we are making deals for a composer to work on a film. Um, we, we have that conversation early on with that composer when they're getting the first cut. And there are some composers that ask that they please watch the cut, the movie, the first time without temp. For that, for that very reason of frustration, do this. And that they do that. don't want to be jaded to their first idea. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sometimes the filmmaker will be okay with that, and sometimes they're, they they insist that they watch it with the temp so they can understand what's going on in their head because they have um, they don't feel that they can communicate it verbally and want it to. But 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 I I do appreciate that notion when a Composers like, can I my can my first experience with this project be without any influence from anybody? You 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 hired us because you want us to do this job. So get he or she a shot at coming up with thematically or vibe or sonically or palette wise what they want to do, um, because you it could be ten times better the get go. What happens then when you when you submit ten cues, let's say twenty minutes of music. And they're like, not really feeling it. And you put in <laughs> three weeks work already. <laughs> and you're like, and they're like, no, nah, I just like the temp better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really disheartening. How does that, how does your, what does your ego do at that point? Start again from scratch? Like just, okay, let's just, with the tail between our legs, start writing what the temp is like. Or it's like, like, or it's like, like you get, you get hired to do a show and you get, your package includes four musicians and they've tempted it with a 90 piece orchestra from a John right. Williams movie. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, sure. Let, let me just, let me just rip that off for you. No problem there. I mean, while you're there, let's talk about that. Uh, the packages, the package concept, right? Cause you act as both sometimes a studio and sometimes you're the supervisor. So right. you're saying you're hiring the composer and you're saying, Oh guys, okay. You make a deal with their agents. Talk about the process of what, the score calls for and when it changes, when the ideas change in the middle of the process and they've been given X amount of dollars to do a package with X amount of budget for an orchestra or an orchestra, X amount of musicians or combos. Talk about that process for a second, if you wouldn't mind. So usually I think, generally speaking, everybody, uh, uh, the composers on this call and Gabe, I, probably you and I would uh, agree on this, but, but majority of the television uh, composer agreements or package agreements. And that, and sometimes there's a provision that will, and we do this to protect both the show and the composer. Well, we'll say that this package includes up to X amount of musicians and put a cap on it. So if the creative changes, and if it was gonna be an EDM score, but now it needs to be an orchestral score with a choir, then nobody's asking the composer to go, you know, write themselves a check from their own checkbook to pay for uh, uh, the, those musicians. And it's up to the production to then find the money for the change to do something like that. Um, so um, there's been, there have been other functionality of a composer agreement that allows for an orchestral budget based on approval of a said budget um, it, it, all the deals are different. The, the, one of the key indicators here is hopefully you, you've had a 
reasonable creative conversation, but both the composer with the showrunner or the director about a style and a vibe and the, the showrunner or director with the studio or with the network or with whoever they're working with on kind of like, yeah, we, we think this is a cool approach so that when we're making a deal, we're making a deal with that in mind so that we're, we're not putting anybody, painting them into a corner. And you brought up something earlier that I think Danny brought it up about color. And Gabe, maybe you could, you could all handle this one. Um, people say, well, what, is, what does a music supervisor do? And I say, well, sometimes you have to be a translator between you know, director, composer, editor, producer, label, publisher, all these different people that you're trying to get the music for and from and to. Um, so talk about that role of translator because as Danny was talking about, you know, having to sell cues or music to people, to, to the showrunners and directors, it's a, it can be a tough process because sometimes you'll think, oh my God, this is it. This piece of music is amazing. They'd be like, yeah, it's okay. And, and that process can be very frustrating for a supervisor and a composer. So I'd like to talk about, you know, first music supervisors as translators and then expound on a little bit what Danny was talking about, how to get, you know, because it is a very inexact science of what music is so, it's not, you know, not black and white. It's like what works and what doesn't work for some people will work for others. So if you guys could just expound on that a little bit, it'd be great. I, I think I'll, I'll jump in. I, I mean, I think like you're, you, you hit on a good point. I think music is super subjective. And, you know, I always use the example that if you described the, your perfect cue to six composers, all six composers would come up with cues that were completely different and unique and, and would have nothing or maybe not much in common. And so I think a lot of it's trying to get into the, the, the boss's head. If that boss is a director on a film or if the boss is a showrunner on a TV show, I think it's about trying to figure out what they're trying to achieve with the, with the music. And, you know, much like other aspects of the music supervisor job, I think it's a little amorphous where we have to do whatever it takes to get it done. If, if something, you know, I'm not skirting this question, but I mean, like, it's the kind of thing where if you, you, I'll ask questions back and say, sort of say like, what about that cue are you liking? What about the temp are you liking? What does it make you feel inside? And try to use different vocabulary in terms of feelings and like, and colors and things that aren't necessarily music driven. Because I would say at least 75% of the showrunners and directors I work with come in on the first day and say, look, I just want to let you know I'm music illiterate. I don't know about notes and measures and, and instruments. I just know what I like and I want it to be the right music. And so a lot some, of it- kind of yeah, trying, Sometimes we're talking about something that's emotional. Yeah. So it's a very hard thing to define. Emotion's very subjective. And, and, and about the plot. You know what I mean? Like, they're like, this is the part before she realizes that her father is still alive and we want to have that anticipatory feeling. You know, using that kind of vocabulary and that description of how they're trying to tell the story is oftentimes a good starting place from my experience. So don't you composers all know when someone says to you, more red, more red. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that is the color thing to me is the most amorphous thing out there. Um, we had a couple of questions. Um, for the Ozak composer fellas, the suspense cues in that show are just bananas. And obviously the show works on so many levels because you have this family story, but yet they're involved with some crazy shit uh, and all sorts of crazy people. So I'm curious as a, as a, as a pair, as a team, how do you split your responsibilities and maybe get into it a little bit about the uh, heightening the suspense in that show, which you guys do a fantastic job doing. Thank you. Um, well, um, so the question is kind of two parts. One, how we collaborate yes. in writing, and then one, how we achieve the, the Ozark kind of palette, I guess. Um, the way we kind of approached Ozark from season one, we met with Jason early, like very early on before this shot or anything. And he was just, I mean, it's one of those situations where you have a, a director, a producer who's just so eloquent with music. He's, he's like very well versed in music. And he was really like, it was really like immediately understandable what he was looking for, you know? He knew our music really well. So he knew how to talk to us about what we do already. 
um, he kind of explained the tone he was going for, um, you know, the juxtaposition between the kind of majesty of the natural, uh, you know, the, 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 the nature there, plus the kind of the grittiness of the human occupancy and the boats and the rusted out cars and stuff. And, um, and so from there, we kind of, you know, we just, we, we already had kind of a sense of what we like, I don't know, the feeling of the, of the show. And then they would actually send us uh, dailies from their shooting, um, which was great. You know, like this is like one of those things with temp and all that kind of stuff. It's like, it's like temp, it, it does really good things when there's very little time to work on something. But if you have a lot of time, you know, that's when we like to get stuff without any temp, without any music ideas. Because often we can be that temp with original music at some point, if, if we get in early enough. And Ozark was like that. And we could, you know, we, we built this, this sound as they were building the show. So it was a very organic process. It was really fun. Um, and I mean, we, we you know, we, we sampled all sorts of like junk and, and garbage, <laughs> garbage music. Um, and we made, you know, our own kind of uh, like, like instruments out of like stuff. Um, oh, you mean garbage like garbage, not like the Butch Vig band from back in the 90s? Uh, no, <laughs> like, like pipes and bottles and, right. and plastic. That's cool. And, That's fun, huh? Yeah, it was really fun. And that became the kind of the backbone of the percussive aspect of the, of the music. And then everything kind of grew out of that. Um, in terms of how Danny and I collaborate, we've, so I, I just moved to LA like um, um, six months ago or so, in November. Um, but I was in New York and he had moved to LA a couple of years ago. Um, but we, you know, we don't sit together necessarily and write in the same room. We'll, we'll write separately and then share stuff constantly. So we have everything, basically all our sessions are on Dropbox and they're updating constantly as we record stuff and, and write stuff. Um, so it's like a, it's like a weird separate, but together collaborative process. We're kind of like just digging in, you know, we'll wake, I'll wake up, maybe write something. And then in the afternoon, I'll be like, Danny, check this out. And he'll go in there and, and delete some things, add some things, whatever. Um, and the same thing, vice versa. So it's, it's kind of always different with every project. We don't have any kind of set recipe for how we do it. Um, but we've gotten pretty, um, pretty efficient at working like that. Great. And um, theme song wise, obviously theme songs are incredibly important um, for the show. So uh, whether it's a song or whether it's a score piece, um, talk about theme songs, Evie, and because obviously Game of Thrones, I mean, Westworld, these are some classic themes and, and you guys have all been involved with making great theme work. Um, talk about the, the importance of theme songs and how they get created. Well, I, I would generally say that, that cr creating something, whether it be with an artist um, or, or, or with a composer is creatively preferable, at least for me, than just finding a cool song and licensing it for it. It allows for an, a thematic imprint to the show and, and especially when the composer is doing it because it, it sometimes can be a suite of music or it can be something that is, uh, big part of the through line of the score to come by by coming up with one of the main thematic elements and a main theme and like remains perfect example of game of thrones you 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 periodically will hear that thematic material throughout the show when it when it pertained to the the the, the 10,000 foot view or the bigger uh, show point of view opposed to the individual themes for the characters and it and it's a re, it's a really good brand musical branding avenue to take um and for, for me I'm, i just creatively much prefer that but that said it comes from all different places and sometimes scripted someone has written the song that is exactly what they want to open it up and sometimes we want to ex explore that idea with artists and have lots of people write lot lots of 
song ideas and play with things and then cast artists to do those things and those particular pieces that we've liked. And we've done a lot of those different styles and variables over the years, especially with my relationship with HBO. Right. Uh, anybody else have thoughts on themes? I mean, I think I think most most composers would, you know, it's always preferable to to do, you know, to do it. I think it's a great way to put your stamp on a particular show. But I think, you know, sometimes, as as Evan said, it really it's it's about the, the the creators, what what they had in mind. And sometimes there there are shows where there is no 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 theme song at all. On Ray Donovan, for instance, we used to have. This piece that became a de facto or recap was the was sort of the main title. But eventually we kind of after I don't know five, six seasons, we, we decided not to have a recap anymore. And there was no more theme song. But I think when there's a, a an opportunity, you know, it's great on on um, I just did this show called The Loudest Voice, where we kind of where we had a proper uh, main title and it's can be very, very satisfying and 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 can really frame the experience of the viewer. So I think it, it can be really good. Yeah, on that show, which is a fantastic series, by the way, I happened to see I to see Bombshell, and then I was like, I wanted to know more. I went back and binged the whole thing, the depth of evil of Robert Roger Ailes. Mm -hmm. um, talk about the approach for that, uh, your music on that show. Yeah, the approach was, was very interesting that this was, there was one rule that we had to follow in that show that it was very difficult and eventually kind of got, you know, we, we got, a, I got a, a hang of it, which was you had to be, the music, it's always from Roger's point of view. So no matter how, how, how monstrous, and believe me, he was monstrous as we all know, we couldn't be judgmental with the music. And so even, for instance, on the second episode, 9-11 happens. And rather than playing the tragedy of 9-11, of we had to play what Roger saw as the opportunity of his lifetime of like, okay, now I'm going to really put forward this evil plan that I've had in my mind all, all the time. And when there were scenes where he was doing all the horrible harassing and just despicable things, we always had to do it from his point of view and kind of what kind of the music had to become his, his feeling and his completely sometimes most of the time, very delusional view of what he was doing and that oh, this, I loved what I did or, you know, and, I, you know, we're really doing something great for America. So it was about having, finding this weird kind of uh, distorted, twisted patriotism that he kind of believed in. And always, whenever we deviated from his point of view, it felt untrue to the show. Now that's for that particular show, uh, you know, Bombshell was obviously a different different thing and there was many more points of view but but loudest voice you know was always uh roger's pov and and it was a rule that we never broke and whenever we tried it just the the show uh, like a director i worked with always told me you know the, the the show will spit out the music that it doesn't want and it would always do that it would spit it out and it was just like no let's get back to roger's point of view so you had to go to the dark side and then ignore it. Yeah, you had to kind of like play his, like sometimes what, what some things would be almost horror-like um, because they were horror-like the way that he was, you know, treating basically everybody in his life. But it, it had to come from this delusional place of this. Of yeah. this life. Wow. And uh, it was, it was a, you know, it was very kind of a brain twister, but a very interesting creative, creatively. And on the Ray Donovan side, was there a, because obviously he's a very flawed character, uh, but you have to root for him because obviously he's your hero, if you will. Um, what was the, was there a certain theme uh, that Ray had or how did you work his ups and downs of his life? You know, that, that is a very, there's such a complex tapestry of characters and we had character themes, uh, but I'm more of a believer in dramatic themes or emotional themes, personally. Now, that doesn't apply for everything, but I find that in my own work, what tends to kind of uh, work best is, is to have themes for certain kind of emotional beats and not necessarily, okay, here comes, you know, 
here comes Ray or, or you know, here comes, um, you know, Mickey, his father and or, you know, anything like that. So it, it tended to be more about the darkness and the emotionality of the characters. And also in Ray, there was a very interesting dance of score and, and source. A lot of the times, you know, the source did a lot of important things, particular humor. It was something that whenever we try to sort of color the score with humor, it never felt right. So whenever we needed some kind of humor in the music, it usually tended to be from songs. And also um, in, you know, bringing it back to the idea of supervisors and composers collaborating, there were a lot of places on, on Ray Donovan where score and songs would kind of merge. And I would sometimes build long intros into a song, or sometimes we would have overlays over a song or people singing on camera and all of that. So uh, in Ray was was very kind of uh, kind of a kaleidoscope of, of of different approaches all the time. But I think mostly it was about covering the darkness and also even though it's not Roger Ailes, I do feel like in general that you have to have empathy for your characters as a composer. I personally feel that way. So if you're scoring like a serial killer, you kind of have to still have empathy for them and try to play that character out uh, as opposed to just kind of, oh, here's the evil person, here's the evil music. I think life tends to be more interested and complicated than that. And I find that music and certainly the way that I work with music, I, te I, I like to kind of blend those the shades of gray uh, as much as possible. I find and that- On Ozark side, um, last night I watched the episode where Jason gets kidnapped to Mexico, the drug cartel, and there's a, you know, obviously the intense score of him, you know, him trying to be broken, being in this dungeon, if you will. And then they kick in the hardcore metal to try to fucking break him down. First of all, Gabe, I, I didn't get this, uh, find out what that was what was that piece that was used in that episode the metal piece i think uh that's brujera i think i gotta oh, confirm it but some hard were, shit. they were really we really wanted to make it authentic uh mexican metal to be like what would they would be playing and uh you know hopefully it was you know it's what you would torture someone with I couldn't wait to get out of that room. I was listening. Yeah. And then Saunders and Danny on your side. So that episode, for example, very intense. You know, you don't know if he's going to get killed. He obviously can't get killed because he's the main character and his name's above the door. Spoiler alert. But uh, Saunders, what was your, and Danny, what was your approach to that particular scene of torture slash capture? Well, that's the thing. It's, it's interesting what Marcelo's saying because, you know, there's, and we do this often too. It's you know finding that empathy in a in a character or in a situation to kind of not mislead the audience, but but you know go somewhere. Let let the audience think about what they're watching rather than just spoon feed it to them. Um, with something like Ozark, it's, it can get a little different because you can really like you know that Jason's character is so likable. You're always kind of you know he's he's bad, but you like him and you want him to come out right. So you can almost go super dark and make people think he's gonna die all the time. Yeah. And, it's, and, and they know he's not, but they're like, oh, no, maybe. You know, so it's, it's interesting how that works, you know, like, um, but with those are in general, we've had more license than a lot of other projects that we've worked on to, to, re to really dig into the darkness. Um, and that's why it's super fun for us. But, um, I mean, don't also don't like, I think we, the one credit of theirs that I think you, you may have skipped over was The Outsider, which uh, was a recent thing that Danny and Sonder did for HBO and I did with them also, but it was a little, it was a totally different vibe in terms of like the personnel involved and the decision making. But like, again, your guys score on that was insane and it was a different and unique, but it was so haunting and scary and I was freaked out my whole time. Yeah, that was that was very much about restraint, I think, um, and the the kind of you know the dread that lies kind of in between music, in a way, I guess you know um, you, the less is more. Well, yeah, because you mentioned the word heavy-handed before, and that's the thing that you know a bad score can take a thing too far over one way, and what you guys are talking about is the nuance of not going too far over the top, um, yeah. building building it in we always say to with directors to uh what 
it's something that's heard a lot is to give the audience more credit than they deserve. Uh, yeah. That's the whole thing. And a lot of the times the first cut of a film or, or something, the director is still not confident about how the, how the film is going to turn out. And there's certain scenes that might, the lighting might not be right or there's certain performance aspects. So they put in music, especially temp music, going back to the temp, to kind of fix it and make it look as polished as possible. Uh, that happens a oh, lot. Yeah, overcompensating. Yeah. And we're that like, also, why? why? That, also speaks, that also speaks to the fact that you guys work on cool projects because there's plenty of projects that can use heavy handed score oh, yeah. when, the, when it's not that great, you know? Right. That's true. That's true. That so really we, I want to reintroduce the, our panelists here. We have Saunder. We have Danny. Uh, they just did the show. They did the season one of Ozark four. What is it? Season three. Three. three yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> worked on that. And then uh, Marcelo, um, was great composers, done stuff like Dark Waters and The Affair. Uh, and Evian and he, Evian Clean, uh, who's done couple hours of TV by now. They work together on the Muhammad Ali documentary, which I think Marcelo is going to close us out with a piece in a couple minutes. But um, so I just want to reintroduce, we have about 15, 20 minutes left. We're going to do some questions from the world. Um, this one goes out to, which one oh yeah, I had a good one from, um, uh, which one would I want to pick? Uh, oh, the tone. Now let's talk about the creative process behind selecting music to set the tone um for big big versus small um the idea of you know how to build scale in the music when you know things the scenes like there's an arc to them so could talk about the process of building 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 the arc of your music and and how you look to do that and you know do you start out with one simple instrument and just keep adding to it um, talk about something that, you know, you maybe a piece or just anything, how you do that process on the composer side. Um, I mean, you know, this is, I mean, it, there can be so many different ways. I don't mean to kind of uh, get out of, of answering the question, but um, one thing in terms of size that I find very interesting, and I, I think uh, I, I see this happen a lot is when when sometimes people have this feeling that music can make a movie seem bigger than it is and it's certainly there's no question that that music can enhance and kind of really make something come to life but one thing that i find it um, uh, very treacherous is when music gets too big it can actually make the film or the show seem smaller and I think finding the right scale, and I think that's the, the idea of less is more of the, or avoiding the heavy handed, but like sometimes, especially projects that are not necessarily very big and, and people are like, I, I really want this to feel like a big budget thing. So let's put a big orchestral thing here. And even when there is a budget for that, I find that, you know, finding the right level, the right temperature is what I like to call for a scene emotionally or in terms of scope is it's that's where i think i think our job is like actors you know you can't overact when i worked with with uh, denzel washington he was so like on top of it to make sure that the music was never pushing the performances beyond what they could be that i actually uh, i think sonder said less is more and I, I actually had a big poster that said less is more and i put it in front of my um, right behind my screen to always remind me and of course fences was basically a movie with non-stop talking and it was a play the first cue comes 40 minutes into the thing so it's a very specific thing but i find that in terms of size i think being careful to not overact with the music because you can really transform a great scene into melodrama by making something too hot it's a great term do not overact with the music that's fantastic you know there's a there's another thing about thematic structure that comes up in a lot of spotting sessions with composers and that they may write a, a really memorable really strong theme and have that demo mocked up with you know eight players ten players uh, uh, multiple instruments and then when you go back to spotting and the first time that we hear that theme, there's conversation about, can we have this just simply played on the piano? 
-hmm. And then eventually through the arc of the show or the arc of the movie, you almost deconstruct the cue and then reconstruct the cue through the arc to build a particular storyline. And I, I find that really effective. And Marcella, to your point, it would you you definitely are stepping on two people having an intimate conversation with a 90 piece orchestra behind you. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So I want to ask another important part of this music department is editors, music editors specifically, and editors. So editors, they're the first ones in the room. They're responsible a lot of times for temping. Um, and then you guys, as you talked about, sometimes have to undo that work. Um, how important it is it to have a great music editor working with you and, and just talk about overall the relationships with editors and music editors on all of your fronts? I, I am a big believer that, you know, there, I, I mean, obviously, I don't think anyone would disagree that they're an integral part of the whole team. I mean, well, a good music editor can make the difference between making your life easy and smooth and it, you know if, if a cue doesn't fit exactly they can massage it into fitting so that it, does, it works within the scene and and the best music editors there's a huge difference in working with them and seeing how uh just just how they use their artistry to to help composers and music supervisors sell through the concepts that we're trying to sell through constantly because like you could just plop a song or a score cue onto a scene and it rarely is going to fit perfectly you know it's about nuancing it into there and having it fade up at the right time and you know maybe dip under the dialogue so the you know the director doesn't feel like it's interfering with what he's trying to say and it doesn't step on a joke if it's a comedy and doing that while kind of keeping the integrity of the song and and constantly I, i'm sure evian you would agree with this we're getting told like uh I, you know i like this but i just wish we could start at the chorus you know and figuring out a way to get into the chorus without feeling artificial and fake and, and making it and work like that. And music editors, I think, are, are one of the most important people in, involved in our whole process, for yes, sure. Yes, I, I, I agree with you 100%, invaluable. And yeah. a great music editor can just, with the, with the right attitude towards the project as a whole, can really help and assist a composer and a music supervisor. And I would, I would, it's it's re really important for composers, at least with my experience. So I'll let the composers chime in a little bit too about their relationships with their music. Because we always ask when we're making a deal for a composer, is there a particular music editor that the, that the composer or asking the composer directly they like to work with? And we try to honor that when we when we can because of how important those things are. Yeah. Uh, I I uh, I agree. I mean, I find that like, especially in television, the music editor, you know, is one of the most important, uh, you know, members of my my team. And of course, they they are there for the whole show. But I find it that they can, you know, I have my, you know, behind saved, you know, at the dubbing stage more times than I can tell you by a music editor knowing where the bodies are buried and sometimes something is simply not working and they can, in the eleventh hour, kind of concoct something or fix something that is not there. And also, I, in certain projects and for certain types of, of scenes, I find it, I love to see what they do. So when I start a season of a show, I'll write a lot of wild music and also have them parallel to what I'm doing, experiment with cutting music that I, you know, in, in different scenes. And I find that process very illuminating and sometimes teaches me a lot about my own music by having somebody else cut it in a place that I didn't, you know, I didn't imagine it being there to begin with. Danny Saunder? I mean, yeah, it's like, having, it's like having another guy or girl on your team uh, also to convey uh, how, how a cue might be working. Because they'll be in the room with the director uh, and everybody, and maybe the composers, we're, we're in our studios, and like they're there like trying to make a cue work that might not have been working, and they're taking the stems and moving them around and they're like working and they're kind of excited about it and they can even help dish it over to the director to to approve it and get it right and get what they're looking for an editor is like another composer for us many times like it's like yeah. i think they're the great unsung heroes of the film yeah. industry yeah they're so helpful they're on your team and doing work and like about being creative 
and working and, and, and but without uh, the problem, you know, of, of any egos getting stepped on because they're like a middleman, they're like a bishop on the chessboard. Very, they, very important. They can, they, can bring, they can bring the showrunner or director into the creative process in a way that they wouldn't be able to do on their own. Yeah. And so they, they, so the, 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 that point person, that director is now part of creating that piece of music by being there working with that music editor. And, and it is, it's, it, he, he's, an amb he's an ambassador to your music, you know, he is, he, he, and he knows, as Marcelo said, that you can reach back to a, a cue in act three and, and, uh, and reconfigure it or lay, because it's in the right key, lay a top line from one cue onto another and solve the director's per issue in real time, um, hugely invaluable. Yeah. And just getting back to your earlier question, John, like the, about a picture editor, I'd say like on a show like Ozark, we have some of the best picture editors, Cindy Malo, Vix Patel are like, inc not only incredible editors, but incredible. Malo. With, with music and uh, you know, so a lot of times we, whether it's temp and I know we've been through the conversation about temp, but you know, by the time we see an episode, a lot of times it's in pretty good shape. Like it's in great, this place where the music, it does the right things. Maybe it's not perfect, you know, and, and that's like up to us to, to get it there, but they're working with us and in communication with us from the jump and, and working with talented, skilled editors who, especially who like music, uh, are, is also like a huge, huge treat. Yeah, I think it's interesting when you're with an editor who's really musical, it is makes your job so much better. And then when you have an editor and you don't have the money specifically for a music editor to help you, uh, it's much more challenging. And, oh, yeah. you know, talk about that process, Gabe, when you don't really, and you have to solve the problem because to me, the editor, again, they're the first people there. They spend weeks and weeks and weeks in the edit room with the director producer before anybody gets to see anything. And a lot of times music people come in next before any, anybody else in the organization gets to see the project because they want to show it with a good musical light. How do you overcome when an editor is not musical? Um, you know, that's tough. That's run, tough. run. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully, look, I mean, you know, I think knowing, it, as long as an editor is aware that they're not musical, then you're in fine shape. Because, you know, if you know where your, you know, what your assets are and where your flaws are, then, uh, like, then they'll ask for help and they'll want to be more collaborative. I mean, some people who think they're great at it may not want to, you know, may think that they know better than everybody else. Whereas somebody who says like, look, I'm not great with music, I wish you could help me, happy to jump in and, and try to help them overcome that. Um, but a lot of times, I mean, fundamentally we're making movies and TV shows and we're part of the support process for storytellers and how they wanna get their message across. So a lot of times when I've seen very rough cuts early on, you know, you sort of just go with, you know, someone recently said you follow the bouncing ball. You go with that day, you know, that day needs you to help put music in the scene that's going to make it more emotional. Next week, that same scene could be a joke, you know, and the week after that, it could be a romantic scene. Like, however they cut it and so much emphasis is on the picture and the story and how that changes throughout the process, that a lot of it is kind of just hanging on and doing your best in the moment and then eventually getting it to a place where the whole thing becomes a cohesive unit and you're doing and helping the storyteller tell the story they want to get on the screen. Yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, I've had situations before where I like knew that this cue was, was the right cue and it wasn't pitched the right way. It wasn't cut the right way. And I hit myself like, well, you know, I wish I would have done it this way or this way. I would have cut it this way. And then sometimes you just come back and you wait it out. And yeah. You come back and you're right. Cause the ball could bounce a different way another day. And the other thing you brought up is the ego of it, right? The ego of person who's in control, they're the filmmaker, you know, we are service people, right? We serve the master of the film or the TV show. And the idea of dealing with people with egos to think they know better or this cue doesn't work or it can't work, 
and the nuance. Like I tell people, the music supervisors, composers, they have to have a, uh, in a room, like you go into a spotting session room and people that blurt out, you know, things that might be inappropriate in a conversation, you know, so when to speak in a spotting session, when to speak up is really kind of important and nuance uh, as a supervisor. So Evian, you know, when you're working with new people and, and Gabe and all you guys, when you're working with people for the first time in the creative process, talk about what people, what advice you can give uh, other creators out there when they're trying to collaborate with people on the nuances of working together for the first time in the creative process with people's work. So, so it's interesting you say that, John, one of the philosophies at Neophonic and when we were in our group meetings and talking about projects and troubleshooting between projects and different suits on different projects is, 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 um, is the adage of read the room. Yeah. Read what the That's room. What I, was I was looking for, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, are, are we in a scenario where the showrunner or director just wants to talk about how he feels about everything and everybody just needs to listen and take notes? Are they looking for help and support? Um, if they're, they stop and have a conversation during a spotting session about sound effects, do you as a music supervisor feel the need to comment? Is it the right time to comment? Would you put, how do you feel if you're having a conversation and the sound editor starts to talk about music? So read, read the room, who, who's, who's driving, who's and the think, support? And I think that's a great point for every project individually, because I think some people go into a project and they have an incredible relationship with a showrunner who wants their advice on every you know sound effect and every score cue and then your very next project that you could be working on a week later or a month later it's completely the opposite and assuming that you should have the same philosophy in both situations is a fail because because right. like you know if the next one will say i like who the fuck are you like i don't care about your opinion on the sound effects you know like you this is what i want you to do and so just like reading the room and treating every project individually like that is, is super important. That's great advice. Yeah. And also, you know, sometimes I think that talking can help a lot. Spotting is all about talking, but you know, some people say talking about music is like dancing about food, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's this very kind of subjective thing that, that you're trying to put into words. And I think as, as composers, music supervisors, sometimes you simply have to kind of guess what they want and you have to just really create a solution for them even when there might not be enough verbal information for this and i think being trying to zero in instinctively you know with with the, with the creator and and trying to just i i hate to say it some 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 like with barry levinson who i worked many many times after a couple of movies we barely talked but i had to create and provide things that he would like. And of course, he would give me notes when, when he didn't like something, but it was very much about, you have to kind of divine it out of thin air what, what they want. And I think still the majority of what we do, the really interesting part is that they want you to bring your expertise. They want, they want you to find a solution for them. And maybe sometimes people do get stuck in temp and all of that, but for the most part, I think they're looking for us as the lead music supervisors or composers to just find that solution for them. And especially in a TV show where there's no time, I think they really are into like, okay, get it done for me, please. And let's stop talking about it and just get well, it done. You just brought up, we have a couple minutes for a couple of questions, but uh, jumping off that, you guys have really done great in your careers by jumping between music and film. And time is obviously the essence on uh, what we talked about in movies, you have more time than TV, which is every week, you got to crank this out and get it done to keep the schedule. But if any of you would just jump on that topic, like how do you approach the differences of scoring and or supervising film versus TV? And I know time is the answer, so you, but you can expand a little bit. I think it's all about time. I mean, I think, you know, on a film, on a, you know, what used to be a schedule of a film that you might have like six weeks or something, maybe two months if you're lucky, sometimes you have to squeeze a whole uh, season of television. So I think that the, the, it's a lot less second guessing on TV, personally, I think anyways, I mean, you just have to kind of 
get through it and, and move to the next thing and not be too precious. But TV has become, it, it's at such a high level now that I think people basically expect the, them to sign like film scores. And my very first experience and my very first lesson in TV was actually from Evian. I remember we were doing a movie for HBO and I said, Evian, do I need to think about this differently? Because it's, it's a movie, but it's for TV. And he said, no, it's a movie. Just think of it as a movie. And I never, I've always taken that to heart. Um, for the rest of my career, basically. But you just have to run a lot, a lot faster on TV. It's another reason why we like to, you know, when we start to talk to people about new projects, we like to get in as early as possible, if, especially if it's a TV show, so that you have some of that time to think of it as a, as a, as a film, you know, as a full body of work, rather than just being thrown into episode one and come up, you know, you, oh, I got a great theme for this situation. And then in episode two, that guy's dead or whatever. <laughs> and then you've got to do it, but um, yeah, time. I was going to say, sometimes it works backwards too. I mean, sometimes having too much time is not good. Yeah. Because uh, it gives you more time to, you know, showrunners to second guess and noodle and try 6,000 different variations of something. When TV, sometimes there's some real, I, I really find it liberating you know, you try a couple things and then whatever the best one is by Friday, which is when we mix, is what we have to go with. Right. You know? that, I agree with you 100% because you give showrunners, directors too much time. And by the way, just so people know, we don't get paid by the hour, right? We get paid by the job. So on a movie, you could last sometimes a year, even more sometimes. I've been on movies that have shut down and come back. And so, you know, our thing is like, do what you can do, get the best me possible as you can and try to move on because- And that's can, fundamentally the, the brain shift, I think, between TV and film, I think. Perfect. Like, perfect. For TV, that's sort of the mentality is do the best work you can within the time limits and the, and the budgets and everything that you have, which is usually much more compressed. And film is more like, let's do our best without those restrictions or like with higher, longer restrictions. And sometimes that can be on and on, like a pitch 20, 30, 40 rounds of music for a scene in a bar in a movie. But that would be absurd for a TV show, you know, because right. you just don't have that much time to do that. Yeah, I would, and I would also add to, the, to that, that di some of the difference on a series side is that for composers that it's a lot different when you're in the first three episodes of season one than it is when you're in the first three episodes of season four. Right. And there's a lot of pressure that's been re released from all of that intense work, figuring out what the show needs and what's working for the show. And you have a, you have a, a much larger toolbox that's already been approved to be able to make your job e easier. You know, there's sometimes you need to push it and stay creative and, and throw the toolbox out a little bit so that you're, you're staying fresh. But it, it do, there is a, quite a difference, uh, uh, even on the picking song front, because you've defined kind of the world in which the, the project lives, whether it's a period piece or it's contemporary using hip hop songs. And, and by, the, by the time you're getting into later seasons, it's just a, so the process is faster, the process is easier. Um, I to, suppose with the caveat, depending on the showrunner. And to your point, like I feel like every movie is basically like the first three episodes of season one. Yeah, exactly, you yeah. Know? Because you don't have the vocabulary and the comfort level of, of ha you know, of, of trying to find the voice of the show or the, of the film. Right. Yeah. And also, you know, to that note, sometimes th there can be this process where, like, later in the show, people, when the show, the sound is defined, they'll say, let's really try to reinvent the wheel here. And you end up writing tens and tens of music, and they say, you know, I think it was really better how we had it originally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's, of course, it's part of what, it's part of what we do. But I think the longer a show goes, at least my experience is that the more it knows what it wants to be. And I think at one point we all have to just keep listening to the show and, and respect what it wants to be, even if it, you know, it might be against your own wishes or 
your judgment, but the show becomes more and more demanding of what the show is and what, what it needs to be and what it wants to be. I, I work on a show that's in its like sixth season right now. And in about season four, the composer almost wanting to like exercise a muscle started writing completely new cues that were in the right world, but like, you know, just new and very like creative and new. And the showrunner took one listen and he was, I vividly remember this, he was like, what the hell are these? <laughs> and everybody was like, oh, these are these great cues. They really bring out the emphasis of this character. And he goes, dude, look, there's like five cues I like in this show. Just reuse them all for the rest of the season. Like that's, that's all we want to hear. This is the sound of the show. This is all I want. This is what people expect. That's what I want. Like variations, you know, of course, like to, to, you know, to customize them for the scenes, but these five themes, like, and nothing, and don't, don't go beyond that. Don't get, you know, like you're saying less is more. Don't feel like you need to flex this muscle for this, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. So uh, that has been, that's been fantastic guys. We just hit the 75 minute mark and I want to thank you all for uh, coming out. We're going to close with a piece of music. Um, but I want to remind you all to please, uh, out there in the world, please join uh, Guild of Music Supervisors. You can sign up for what's called the Friend of the Guild, so you can get our newsletters and find out what we're doing and come to our events in New York and L.A. and London, Canada. Um, so we really appreciate all the support for the Guild. We are a nonprofit organization, so that's really important to support. Uh, next week, we're going to do a panel about how, much like how supervisors and composers work together, next week it'll be about how showrunners and their music supervisors work together. And uh, Liza Richardson um, is a great music supervisor and Jason Kadams who's an Emmy award winning producer will be on. And uh, I'll probably do my um, animated show I'm working on with um, Alan Friedland on a new show called The Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers. And we'll also have one other announcement that'll come out this week. So uh, again, thank you guys all for your time. We really appreciate it. So uh, Marcelo, you and Evian worked on this highly regarded um, LeBron produced Antoine Fuqua directed uh, short series doc series about the greatest um, talk about the music for that and what we're going to close with today um, well we you know uh, this was one of the highlights of my life was working with Evian and Antoine on this project I mean I'm a I was a, 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 a fan of Muhammad Ali before I saw the documentary and then as I learned about his life and and the incredible things that he did uh, it really, uh, we went very deep on this one. And um, there's so many types of different <clears throat> music in the show that it would be hard to kind of really zero it in, in one thing. But I thought, you know, in, in considering how crazy the world is and, you know, what everybody's going through right now, I, I, uh, I picked a cue that it was a cue that um, is played under um, Martin Luther King's uh, death, as well as, um, Malcolm X is that, and it's um, and it's a kind of a, a chorale, a, a very soft and kind of happy, sad piece. And um, we should bring up one thing on the history side of that. So, because I'm doing a doc now about Ali's hometown, and I had uh, lunch with his, sister, his daughter, who's in the film, and she told me the story about uh, how when Maha when Malcolm X went to Mecca, he came back a changed man, and he realized what what the nation of Islam was doing was not, was not the right thing in a way. And yeah. he basically um, had a break with the nation of Islam. And one of Malcolm X's best friend was Muhammad Ali. And the nation of Islam told Muhammad Ali he could no longer be friends with Malcolm X, which really hurt him. But he was so indoctrinated into the nation of Islam that he listened to them and he always, and then, and then Malcolm got killed, uh, assassinated probably by someone in relation to the nation of Islam. And it always haunted Muhammad. So that relationship, I just wanted to throw a little history perspective on it because I am a history buff. Um, but so, yeah, just to add a little power to it because I think that was really a powerful relationship that Ali regretted his whole life. And, and also with Martin Luther King, when, Ali, when Martin Luther King would call, Ali would just go. He would just get on a plane wherever, because he knew what power uh, Martin Luther King was and he would just go and, and be there. So I think yeah. the relationship here is obviously powerful. And the name of this piece is Brothers because Martin Luther King, in one point in the, in the documentary, they're interviewed and they're talking, well, you know, you're, you, you're, you're a Muslim, you, you have one faith, 
you have an, we, we have another, but we're still brothers. And they, they together talk about being brothers and being, regardless of their faiths being different, they still felt like brothers. And uh, that's the name of this piece, it's uh, Brothers. Well, thank you all for, for being here and uh, watching, and thank you, for Mr. Marcello, for closing us out. All right, all right. Nice to be with everybody. <laughs>